Seriously, though, we've heard a lot about extremism recently, a nastier, harsher atmosphere everywhere, more abuse and bother boy behavior, less friendliness and tolerance and respect for opponents. All right, but what we never hear about extremism is its advantages. Well, the biggest advantage of extremism is that it makes you feel good because it provides you with enemies. Let me explain. The great thing about having enemies is that you can pretend that all the badness in the whole world is in your enemies and all the goodness in the whole world is in you. Attractive, isn't it? So, if you have a lot of anger and resentment in you anyway, and you therefore enjoy abusing people, then you can pretend that you're only doing it because these enemies of yours are such very bad persons. And that if it wasn't for them, you'd actually be good-natured and courteous and rational all the time. So, if you want to feel good, become an extremist. Okay, now you have a choice. If you join the hard left, they'll give you their list of authorized enemies. Almost all kinds of authority, especially the police, the city, Americans, judges, multinational corporations, public schools, furriers, newspaper owners, fox hunters, generals, class traitors, and, of course, moderates. Or, if you'd rather be an extremist on the hard right, no problem, fine, you still get a lovely list of enemies, only they're different ones. Noisy minority groups, unions, Russia, weirdos, demonstrators, welfare sponges, meddlesome clergy, peaceniks, the BBC, strikers, social workers, communists, and, of course, moderates. And upstart actors. Now, once you're armed with one of these super lists of enemies, you can be as nasty as you like and yet feel your behaviors morally justified. So you can strut around uh, abusing people and telling them you could eat them for breakfast and still think of yourself as a champion of the truth, a, a fighter for the greater good, and not the rather sad paranoid schizoid that you really are. And all this explains what we've seen at party conferences. Everyone's sitting there looking grim and bored, and then a speaker gets up with real fire in his belly, as well as dyspepsia, and he says, the other party really are the most awful bunch of rotters, the most left-wing or right-wing bunch there's ever been in this great country of ours, and it would be a disaster if they ever got into power or held on to power. That's all we must get into power or hold on to power, but that's going to be a tremendous fight, a terrific struggle, and we can't relax and enjoy ourselves. No, we must struggle and fight and fight and struggle and struggle and struggle and fight and fight against these enemies and then struggle a little bit more at the end of that. And then the speaker goes and sits down and there's a lovely warm glow throughout the hall as if they'd all had tea and crumpets. And everyone looks relaxed and happy and simply radiant with goodwill. Although, if the speaker had said, we must all have lots of fun and be nice to each other and cooperate in solving problems, they'd probably have lynched him or deselected him, or taken all his directorships away. Because attacking our enemies always makes us feel good and excited. In fact, just about the only disadvantage to extremism is that it can never solve problems. But then solving problems is a real bore compared with healing victory and swearing to smash capitalism and crush socialism and generally feeling good. I mean, solving problems involves frustrating things like listening to people with different views and learning from them, which, of course, breaks the first rule of British politics. No other party's ideas are any good. Then, the other irritating thing about solving problems is if the solutions are going to work, they've got to be fair. Well, ask any businessman, he'll tell you a good deal is one both sides can accept. If not, it won't work. But this means that you've got to be fair and balanced, and that breaks the second rule of British politics. Parties represent special interest groups. How can Labour reform the unions when the unions give them 90% of their income? Of course the Tories will reform the unions, but they'll allow self-regulation for the City of London, which gives them a lot of their money. It's a giggle, isn't it? And these two rules are exactly why so many of our problems are not being solved. Because the old British system has been the seesaw. First Labour, then the Tories. No continuity of planning from nationalisation to denationalisation to renationalisation to privatisation. 
and the rest of the time producing those farmyard noises we all know and love from Prime Minister's Question Time. 